we're going to go through the detection evolution. It's going to be very high level, very quick. Uh, then the threat library, what is it, um, some of the players involved. And then I'm going to kind of switch gears and talk about the threat intelligence providers. Who's providing the threat intelligence from a commercial standpoint and how are they doing and how do they compare to each other? So the detection evolution ultimately started way back when um, and it started with antivirus. Basically host based. There's very little, it's very proprietary, there's very little uh, uh, sharing involved. It's not like a snort signature where you can share it with your friends. It's ultimately antivirus signatures provided by the, the antivirus vendors. Then we moved up into the antivirus, or excuse me, into the intrusion detection where it was more network based, commercial as well as open source. So the community is getting a little bit more. Um, needy as far as I want to be able to write my own signatures. I don't want to have to rely on the vendors to provide their signatures. I want to write my own snort signatures and share it with my friends ultimately. Then we moved into the anomaly based. So a lot of NetFlow, a lot of uh, statistics involved to identify anomalies. From there, we moved into the intrusion, or excuse me, into the uh, indicators of compromise, the IOCs. So that was ultimately, again, the community saying, I need to share a targeted attack information with my friends. How can I do that? The easiest way is, again, to abstract the, the consumers and identify the domains, identify the C2s, identify the MD5s, identify the IP address. It's very easily human consumable and that's extremely important when you share um, targeted attack information. Then with the, the crowdsourcing and the sharing becoming such kind of a streamlined viral effect, you get into the more of the custom signatures, the YAR, the chop shops. This again is, is extremely beneficial because it just helps defenders get ahead um, of the adversaries. And then the absolute zen, which we're still trying to identify, is how to share TTPs efficiently. It's extremely difficult to do that because usually it's a malware report or an Intel report or the kind of walls of text. So the old SOC battle rhythm um, around threat intelligence was the, uh, the, the ingestion of external threat intelligence. So whether you're getting that from a commercial feed, whether you're scraping OSINT, uh, whether you're getting, you're, you're involved in a private community, um, public do-gooders, a lot of the people blog essential information um, and it's very indicator rich data on the blogs. So there's a couple streamlined ones that are, that a lot of people check every single day. The government, the FBI, the JIBs, all those documents, they try to share the information that the, excuse me, that they can. Then you get the tool vendors. So a lot of the tool vendors realize how important threat intelligence is, so they release white papers which are just 60 pages of malware analysis correlated with threat intelligence to provide that information to, to the general public. So a fusion analyst, so an intel analyst ultimately is responsible for ingesting usually all this information. Historically, he's had to keep that in some type of Excel spreadsheets, um, documents. It, it's, it's, there hasn't historically been a very good central repository for that information. That information's somehow transferred to the signature engineer. Signature engineer ultimately tries to take that intelligence, wrap it up in type, some type of signature, whether it's a snort signature, whether it's a uh, ArcSight active channel, Splunk, Regex, whatever, and ultimately push that into the environment for the typical blocking and tackling as well as the what's already hit us, the rear view mirror searches. The malware analyst also tries to sprinkle in some of his information that he's gleaned from the actual PEs um, somehow in that process. Again, a lot of it is pushing documents back and forth, tapping people on the shoulder. It's, it's a very um, analyst heavy process. 
And then the security analyst is on kind of the tail end because he's the one that ultimately has to respond to the SIMs, um, insert that information to the ticketing system, and execute a lot of the incident response activities. So the big takeaways from this slide is, one, there's no central repository. There's no central collaboration. There's a lot of analyst muscle that goes into this process. Um, some of the socks that I've gotten visibility into sacrifice tier three FTEs, multiple FTEs, to this process of grabbing information and trying to ultimately just muscle it into a product. So the threat library or the threat intelligence management platform um, is a process to help you automate some of those things. It's, it's, it's taking over that central cornerstone of SOX because it requires, it, it, it's taking the burden off of the analysts and allowing them to actually pr do some level of an analysis. Let me put my clicker down. So the, the red is ultimately the data feed. So that's ultimately a, a uh, whether you're leveraging an API to push and pull, uh, that's the core component is automating that capability. Now the threat libraries, it's a relatively new concept. A lot of them are either homegrown, there's a couple commercial vendors and there's a couple open source that have actually been released. They're all a little bit different. The ones that I've found to be the most beneficial are the ones that can do the indicator management and that's their bread and butter. How do you ingest, analyze, push, nest indicators? So that's gonna be very important in your sims. How do you nest the indicators to minimize the false positives? That's absolutely key. Also, a malware zoo. So that's extremely important because historically you have the malware emulation tools, they're often this isolated island. They're doing the analysis, they're doing all of the, the, the emulation to pull out the IOX. The malware port just kind of sits there. And an analyst has to ultimately kind of chase that down. The other nice thing about that concept is if you have attribution to multiple malware uh, payloads, after a couple months, years, you can ultimately tell your reverse engineer, hey, I want you to look at all the malware associated to this group and give me an evolution. Are they learning from their, from their mistakes? How are they progressing? How are they evolving? Are they changing their TTPs? Having that just knowledge, that storyboard of an attack is absolutely essential to your security analysts as well as your intel intelligence analysts and also is gonna help your malware analysts build a profile for that information. The other important thing are metrics. So living and breathing in a SOC most of my life, the, the guys higher up, the executives, the managements always want you to build metrics. Now historically it's been how many tickets did you guys do this month? the absolute worst quantitative metric in humanity is how many tickets. The better metric is the quality of the tickets, the, the dwell time of the adversary, a lot of that information. So from a threat intelligence or a threat library standpoint, if you can ingest from a ticketing system, from a SIM, you can start to build what are my best sources of intelligence? Is it open source? Is it a paid commercial feed? Is it the government? Is it a, a, a private community that I have access to? Who's giving me the best pool of intelligence? It's a very important um, metric to really help a manager dedicate time and resources to the different parts. So the threat library players, again I mentioned it's in its infancy. They're all over the place. So I don't want to kind of stand up here and tell you which ones are good, which ones are bad, which ones do this, which ones do that. You guys can do that, that, that research on your own because um, it's all going to be different based on your own shop. 
Everything should be based on your own shop. Gartner ultimately just coined the threat intelligence platform and they're trying to define it. Forrester's trying to define it. The community is ultimately trying to shape and shift what these, what these platforms can do and what they can maintain and the analytics involved. The big differentiators are, is it commercial or is it open source? Again, based on your team and shop, open source, it's, it's good, it's free. You're at the mercy of potentially dedicating a dev guy to maintaining it and updating it, building the, the different modules that you need. Commercial, a little bit easier. You can reach out and strangle somebody. That usually gets things working a little bit faster. Cloud versus on-prem. Everything's going into the cloud these days. And that's good to some degree. Again, certain verticals, certain stovepipes, I can't keep my threat intelligence into the cloud. Absolutely, completely forbidden. Other stovepipes, it's attacker information stored up in the cloud. I don't care if it gets, if it gets compromised. The kicker is if you're correlating with your tools, how easily can it correlate with the internal tools? How important is that to you as well? Automation capabilities. This is the absolute most important thing at all. How well does it integrate with both your detection tools? Can it, can it reduce the, not so much number of FTEs, you never want to get rid of FTEs, you want to reallocate them to other, other processes and analytics. But can it talk to your SIM, can it push out to your sensor grid, can you, can you ingest from your malware repositories? How well can it do a lot of that information? And then how well can it, again, operationalize the threat intelligence? If I get a feed from any number of threat, the commercial vendors, does it require a human to basically ingest it, copy and paste and stuff? If you have a, a threat library that can automatically do that for you, you're just saving time and resources. A lot of the shops that I've worked in, again, sacrifice one or two interns to doing that copy and pasting and pushing and, and it ultimately just takes away from their analytical capabilities. So now I want to focus a little bit more on the providers of the commercial threat intelligence. So there's different buckets of commercial threat intelligence. There's the collaborative portals. You have the, the Red Sky, you have Threat Connect. These are ultimately portals that you log into that you can share threat intelligence. The host is providing you a level of threat intelligence and that's pretty good. There's a level of sacrificing somebody to log in to get the information and a lot of the, the portals are actually realizing that and they're starting to kind of push API capabilities which is always nice. There's the access providers back end. This is the sense that as a provider of threat intelligence, I have so much intelligence, I can't just give you an API. I can't just give you a feed. I'm going to give you access to my back end and your analysts can glean whatever they can pivot, they can do whatever they want to do with it. So think of virus totals threat intelligence. Think of um, Mandiant's got one, Endgame's got one, um, passive DNS. All of that stuff, you can kind of take your data and pivot off of that but you need access to their back end. Usually very expensive. Then there's the throw the kitchen sink at it. This is, in, this is almost to the point where I've got a lot of information and I'm just gonna give you a daily dump of indicators that I've seen in the, on the internet that are suspicious or bad. So these, if you think of threat track or IID, um, Norse has got a big dark list of IP addresses. These are ones, again, throwing the kitchen sink at it. It's a lot. It can range from 200,000 indicators per day to millions of indicators per day. So it's up to a consumer to ultimately take a step back and say, can my team ingest that amount of information? What's the frequency? What's the volume? What's the delivery mechanism? All those types of things to really get the best bang for their buck. And then the focused intelligence, the focused consumers or excuse me, providers. This is more of the eye sites, the crowd strikes, the eye defenses. These 
ultimately don't give you the volume, but they give you the targeted attack information. So they've got massive teams ultimately just gleaning the, the internet, looking at the targeted attacks, analyzing stuff, and then trying to find patterns and associations. The really nice thing about the focused feeds is they're starting to provide a lot of context around the indicators. So previous life, I would get an FBI notification, a victim notification, single IP address. What do you want me to do with that is ultimately what I'd go back with them. Give me more context. When did you see the IP address coming out of our subnets? Uh, we can't tell you that. Well, you're killing me because I got petabytes upon petabytes of data to go through. So that's a big key is context is king when you think about threat intelligence. So th the more context they can provide, the better your, your team can kind of pivot around the data and look for exactly what they're looking for. So whether it's part of a kill chain, whether it's part of an indicator role. Again, I mentioned IP address. If you tell me the IP address is associated to the delivery phase and it's part of the downstream IP address, then my analysts have something actionable to go back and look for. If you don't give them that much information, it's going to take them a little bit of time to pivot off data to look and to analyze. And every second lost is, again, the longer dwell time for an adversary. So let's take a look at some of the focused commercial threat intelligence breakdowns. There are a little bit all over the board. Um, and I don't want to name names, but you should be able to kind of decipher my code. Um, but this is a breakdown of what indicator types they're actually providing in their feeds. It's very interesting to see a breakdown of volume, of indicator types, which ones gravitate towards better information, and how they provide that out. Now the TT threat feed is ultimately just to show you the volume. They do massive MD5 distributions. It's very good, but there's no context around it. It's basically kind of, here's an MD5, look for it in your environment, find it, it's bad. Whereas the others provide a level of context around the intelligence, whether it's attribution to the adversary, and again, some of the other parameters that I've mentioned. So when you compare the commercial feeds, obviously you want to see kind of the overlap. So when I started this process, I really got to, I, my hypothesis was they're all got to be reporting the same thing. They all have to have the same indicators. Whether it's a round robin event, whether it's pulling from the same analytical pool, everybody, a lot of the more advanced have access to virus total and use that as kind of a repository of information. But the more I started to dive into the data and compare these feeds, the more there's very minimal overlap at all. There's no silver bullet. These commercial feeds complement each other pretty well. Now you can start to somewhat see um, a certain vendor gravitate towards a certain industry. So some commercial threat intelligence providers really specialize in the financial, financial institutions. Some specialize in the government. As much as they will never say that because that's minimizing their audience and their, their, their dollar figures, you can start to kind of look at who's really pushing to certain pieces and, and components and, and so forth. But it's very interesting to see the the domain overlap within the Venn diagram. Less than 1% of overlap. Pretty impressive between the three. Even more so, and I still, I checked this five, six, seven times, I had friends check it, not one shared IP address among the three major commercial threat intelligence providers. Absolutely staggering. I could not believe that. How can that be so? They're dealing with the same actors, the same adversaries, lots of times the same, well, within reason, the same malware. 
but yet not one IP address is shared between all of those. Now, I admit, I have access to what they're distributing. Now, the back end, probably there's massive, a much bigger overlap. They're just choosing not to whether distribute something that's already out in the industry, whether it's from open source or so, so forth. But it was it's very interesting to see how minimal overlap there was. So the next thing, so I see the overlap. Who got that information out first? My managers want me to justify a, threat, a, a, a paid feed. How can I justify that? Who's getting me the information the fastest? Makes sense, logical, logical question. The kicker was because there was 2% of 1% overlap, whoever was getting me the information didn't really make any difference. It's such a small, minuscule amount. Is it important? Yes, but not with the information, not with the overlap so small you're still getting the information um, hopefully quicker than you would get elsewhere. So timeline analysis, and this isn't ultimately, I'm, I don't want to confuse you, this isn't to who's getting the information out the fastest. This is taking a step back, abstract it. You can see in the timeline that there's attribution for the indicators and the actors and it, it starts to kind of get a little bit bigger, get a little bit bigger and then the big red dots are when Mandiant released the APT1. So that set the precedence in the industry, it's okay to have attribution. It's okay to really dive into who's behind some of these attacks. Before that, it was largely more of a military exercise, a lot of law enforcement had that information, but it wasn't readily available within a lot of the open source or even the commercial feeds. Once Mandiant released that APT, people started to gravitate to that information. And then all of a sudden you see a lot of the threat intelligence providers providing attribution to the actors so that the intel analysts can learn the adversary much better. So bad is bad, but it's good to know exactly the behaviors around the adversary. What are the patterns with the different adversaries? It's very important. To put this graph a little bit into context, I used a lot of the CrowdStrike um, actor names because they're very definitive. A lot of people know what they are. A lot of the other commercial threat providers, they don't really share the internal names, whereas CrowdStrike's a little bit different. Um, so I put all of my indicators from all my repositories into a basically bucket of which adversary um, is that stemming from. Now there's a level of shared infrastructure between some of the adversaries, but I'm willing to, to accept that overlap. So let's look at a couple of adversaries and how the commercial providers are, are ultimately kind of sharing some of that information. A lot of times, when you provide or when we ingest, we see kind of a trickle of information. Now, is that the commercial threat intelligence provider basically saying, let's give them a little and let's see what the adversary does. Let's see if they stop or let's see how they react. Let's see how the industry reacts. So you'll see a couple of indicators released, a couple days, weeks, sometimes even months go by and then you'll see even more indicators, even more indicators, and, and the spigot starts to really open, the floodgates start to really open. And then you get the other commercial threat intelligence providers adding their intelligence and on top of it, um, which is very interesting. And then you kind of get this battle back and forth. So let's take a look at it from another campaign. So this extends over a couple months, but you ultimately see one threat intelligence provider releases it. You'll see a little bit of open source reporting, and a lot of times after some open source reporting, some of the other commercial vendors come out with their information 
and provide it out saying, okay, the industry sees this, the, the, the consumers have a hold of this as a commercial vendor, I better get some out the door real quick. Because that's the first thing they're going to be asking. How, do, how does one of the other vendors provide a white paper and I haven't got no indicators around that adversary from whoever your, your provider is? So you'll start to see how there's a race between when open source intelligence gets released and when the commercial threat intelligence providers provide their indicators as well. And you'll start to kind of see this back and forth, back and forth. And it's very interesting to analyze some of the, the temporal information behind those, um, the dates. But this also goes to show you this timeline that the open source community is actually pretty good about what they do. There's enough vendors who have to kind of flex their, their muscle, whether they provide incident response services and they release a white paper every once in a while. Um, but the open source community is actually pretty forthcoming these days. And the white papers are just indicator rich, 60 pages of just awesomeness. They're very, very nice to, to ingest. Time consuming, if an analyst has to basically, poor bastard has to copy and paste 300 indicators out, heaven forbid the MD5s. Um, but it's something to ultimately kind of consider, especially when you're starting to profile your adversary and which adversaries are attacking you um, and what they might be targeting. So the conclusion is, the amount of non-overlap between the commercial providers is perplexing. I'm still perplexed. They complement each other pretty well. It's up to the consumer to figure out which ones complement them, themselves the best. The threat intelligence library, the threat libraries, it's, it's, it's an early tool, but it's becoming the cornerstone tool because it's a place where all of your your, your collaboration will happen depending on the tool. So the malware analysts will sit there to make notes, the intel analysts will sit there to make notes, the security analysts who are chasing the SIM alerts will ultimately reference that to pull out the documents, the, the, the source documents for information. So it bridges the gap between operational intelligence. It provides that automation so that your analysts aren't having to copy and paste all day or aren't having to sit on a portal all day, they can actually perform analysis. The threat intelligence providers, again, the commercial providers come in all shapes and sizes. You have to take a step back and figure out, do a self-assessment and be true to yourself. If your team doesn't have the resources to ingest more threat intelligence, don't pay $200,000 a year for a feed. Rely on the open source intelligence, push in that. If they do have a couple cycles, figure out which commercial feed is gonna be best for, for your team. What's the volume, what's the frequency? Um, how is it delivered? All of those questions are very, very important when ultimately trying to secure budget for these feeds. Again, context is king. If I can provide an analyst with an indicator, a kill chain, the, the role of the indicator, the association of an MD5, I'm gonna save him a crap ton of time. Because ultimately, if that pops in a SIM, he's gonna turn around, go to his dirty network, look it up, and chase it. And that's all time lost. If you can provide that at his fingertips, you're gonna save him so much keystrokes and time, and he can rope in whoever he needs to rope in, whether it's a malware guy or an intel guy, it's gonna basically just speed up the process for incident response. Any questions?
That's a great question. So ultimately his question revolves around how do you figure out which commercial threat intelligence provider kind of aligns with the targeting that you see? It's a very delicate tap dance. Now, they want your money, you want their service. The best thing is to ask for a pilot. A lot of these threat intelligence providers will offer a 30-day pilot. You have to sign NDAs up the wazoo. And you'll get an, a look at their basically historical indicators. And a lot of them will basically kind of give that away real quick as far as the indicators. They won't give you the context. You won't get the sexy reports that are telling you all the different patterns and trends that they're seeing, but a lot of times they'll provide you, uh, whether it's a subset or the full Monty of indicators, and then you can kind of compare that with your incident response reports, and hopefully you've uh, really trained your incident responders to identify and to maintain a list of the indicators that are associated to the incident at hand. There is, but you need a, from my knowledge, um, you need a, some type of dev guide or, or some type of database guy to ultimately run those numbers and just run some type of mathematical equation over it to determine the overlap. Yep, yep. Any other questions? A lot of it really, uh, sorry, let me repeat the question. His ultimate question is, um, what are some of the obstacles and challenges revolved around sharing the TTPs? And a lot of times the TTPs are, are, are these little tidbits of information, sexy information in these massive Intel reports or malware reports. Ultimately, trying to extract that into human consumable bullet points is the biggest thing. Um, it's tough to consume some of the malware stuff. So you decode comment crews exfil or you decode something. It's hard to put that in human form for a malware analyst to really uh, regurgitate into something that a security analyst or an intel analyst can kind of take and go forth and conquer. The other kicker is a lot of the communities, you've got to figure out, you've got to bond together with a couple of friends and build that relationship for actual sharing. And that's one of the biggest um, hurdles of the industry is how do you share that information um, quickly and easily rather than emailing Word docs to each other or emails that have these TTPs in them. Um, does that answer your question somewhat? It's a hurdle of ultimately what format do you put those TTPs in and ultimately how to provide context around that format. Yes, sir. So the question is what do the, what do the analysts do with attribution? So it's a very important question and it's gonna depend on the, the role. So the Intel analysts take attribution and find a pattern of what they're targeting. So in my previous life, defense contractor, what contracts are they targeting with their Spearfish? What's the association of the Spearfish recipients? Um, the malware guys love attribution because they start to evolve the, the life cycle of the malware. How, are the, how is the adversary building his knowledge, how is he learning, how is he evolving? And that's gonna help the malware guy dissect information much faster. The security analyst loves attribution because we can push that into a sim and build active channels based off of an actor, an actor group, or even the kill chain. So ArcSite, um, I've used ArcSite for a, a number of years, but how do you build active channels for the delivery? for the, the C2, that will subconsciously help your security analysts dictate and prioritize what events they're going to 
triage first. And if there's an attribution to the event, then it immediately gets eyes. Whereas now, pushing indicators into a sim, you ultimately get a running active channel of like thousands of events potentially. And there's no prioritization. But if you can feed that information and that context into your sim or even nest the indicators, extremely, extremely powerful. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So the question is, is there a common format? The sticks and taxi stuff is slowly coming along. We'll see. I've got, I've, I've got very skewed um, views on that, so I can kind of share those after the fact. But a lot of the providers will provide it in anything you can consume. So whether it's XML, JSON, CSV, um, anything that you can ingest, the providers, they want your money, they will give it to you in any form that you want. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Those are ultimately cryptonyms for the different commercial threat intelligence providers. So I don't want to put them in the slide, but I can talk to you afterwards and share those. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much.